fortunate enough to see uh, Dr. Mario Moda, uh, who is on the board of the American Medical Association and also on the IDA board. And uh, he left us his talk that he gave at FAU recently. Um, um, a lot of us were there. So, um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to plagiarize a lot of his stuff. And uh, some of these slides are his. Uh, he is, uh, I think I'll start out a little bit with safety and security. And one of the big things about lighting is that if it's bad, um, it's hazardous. And you've all seen this before, where you have glare coming at you. A lot of it is caused by improper street lighting, um, drop globe lenses and things like that. You can see, if you look close, you can see the lights right there. That's the people that are standing there. So glare is a very dangerous thing. The problems that we have are, no, that's better, all these light sources that really direct light upward into trees where you don't need it, areas like that that you can have a football game in and uh, see everything, but fixtures like that um, that are just completely inefficient. Um, our best known globe fixture, which mm -hmm. are pretty ubiquitous around town. And let's take your average carriage fixture. When you look at the light output, let's assume you have a 100 watt bulb in that thing. 50% of the light, or 50% of the wattage, 50 watts out of that 100 is going nowhere, does you no good. 10% of that is going right into your eyes because it's glare. And glare is that hazard I pointed out earlier. And People my age, when you start to form cataracts and things like that, that glare becomes even worse. So it's, it's very age dependent. So finally, out of that 100 watt light bulb, you have 40 watts hitting the ground trying to keep you safe. So you're basically wasting more than two thirds of your energy. Um, imagine if you had a garden hose and you were watering your lawn and it had a leak where most of the water went out before it got to the garden, you'd fix it. Well, let's try to fix the lights. And here's one of those glowing fixtures I told you about. Again, 65% of that light is going to glare and just up, nowhere. And notice that big dark spot underneath it. Uh, full cutoff lighting is what we're looking for. We're talking mainly a change in how we're using the light. Okay, if you're wasting 65% of that light in the globe fixture, by simply putting a shield over it and making kind of a full cutoff fixture, you're gaining all that energy going down to the ground where you need it. So you're actually increasing the amount of light on the ground and you're decreasing sky glow. So it basically is a win-win situation. You could put a bulb in there, you could put a 40 watt bulb in there and it would give you as much light as that globe fixture. As 100 watt. Mm -hmm. As 100 watt. And here's a uh, acorn fixture, very similar to a globe fixture. And you can see it lights the trees very nicely and kind of the ground. And keep your eye on that student. I'm just going to go. Student's still there. Anybody know where she went? Hmm. Go back. If you look real close, keep an eye on that spot right there. Hmm. So there she is, right there. And uh, that's that dark spot I was talking about under the lights. So is that safe? I don't think so. Um, you got the trees lit up nicely. If there are any ninjas up there, you'd find them. But uh, it's not so safe on the ground. Somebody could hide right there and be ready to attack. And again, lighting's not always safe. This is one of those jelly jars that most porches have. And if you actually had that light shielded, you'd be able to see that somebody is actually standing in that gate. Just barely make them out right there. 
Simple shielding makes things a lot safer and you use a lot less energy. Is that okay? Acorn? Hmm? Which one is this? That's Salem, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, your standard city light, um, kind of a modified <coughs> acorn fixture. And most cities are doing these things here, these uh, banners to advertise the city and things like that. So you would expect being on a light at night that you would be able to see the banner. And in fact, no, not so mm. much. Uh, that's glare, and the banner is right there, and you can't read it. So what good is that light doing? And also notice how dark this whole area is, even though there's a great big glary light right up there. Again, wasting energy, not making things safe for you. This is a variety of full cutoff fixtures. A full cutoff fixture simply does not allow light above a 90 degree plane. So all the light you're getting out of that fixture is going down to the ground. And there are decorative ones, there's modern UFO kind of ones, and there's even these like that light that the Salem had, that modified acorn. They put the bulb up in the top of it, so this is actually a semi-cutoff fixture where the majority of the light goes down to the ground and it's still decorative, which is what a lot of people complain about full cutoffs. I mentioned full cutoffs put more light down to the ground, and here is your acorn fix fixture, and this is a decorative full cutoff fixture. These targets on the full cutoff are much brighter than the target you see with this, because most of that light's going up, not doing you any good. There's that dark spot I told you about, not so much here in the full cutoff. So, a lot of advantages. Um, most cities I know of that have modified their fixtures, Boca for instance, we finally got City Hall and the police station and the libraries to go to full cutoff fixtures. They used to have mission style, just like open fixture, just mission style square boxes. They had 400 watt lights in them. They put up full cutoff fixtures with 100 watt bulbs and they had brighter grounds and more uniform lighting. So they saved 75% of their energy right there. And here's a decorative full cutoff fixture. Uh, this is in the Delray Marketplace out by Atlantic and uh, 441. And the reason they put up full cutoff fixtures is back in 2005, Palm Beach County, um, with the help of myself and some other biologists uh, from ERM, uh, Environmental Resources Management, actually rewrote the unincorporated county lighting code to require full cutoff lighting in all new construction. And that's the end result. If you go out west in Palm Beach County, any new buildings you see and everything else are all going to be full cut off lit, um, which is really nice to see. Unfortunately, uh, most of the municipalities on the coast are not in the unincorporated county. They're, they're opt out, so they have their own ordinances. That would be us, right? Uh, yeah, I imagine Lake Work. Lake Worth is part of that. I know Delray is. Pretty much all of them have their own separate ordinance. Street lighting is very important. Uh, glare, again, when you're driving, you don't want that coming onto your windshield. And this is just an example. Here's the drop globe street lights that haven't been replaced yet. And this is up in Canada. And these are full cutoff fixtures. And you can see the road's nicely lit, and you're not getting anything in the eyes. So you got a much safer situation here. And again, full cutoff fixtures will use less energy. Um, you all know about all the fast food joints and gas stations and everything else. They all have these crazy lights, uh, really bright. And they say they need that to attract business. Well, this is a study that was done uh, from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where this station change their lighting to full cutoff. You can see how it actually confines the light to the area of the gas station and actually kind of frames it so you see that it's there. And what they saw 
following that lighting change was their business went up. So it actually attracted people, not scared them away with uh, really bright light. Um, more jelly jars and <laughs> really, you can't see where you're going. So, and while you're walking up the steps, if you find them and don't trip, you got this light going right into your eye. And so that makes it even harder to see what you're doing. And here's a guy that's really afraid of <laughs> burglars and everything else. And it turns out that a lot of burglars that actually do burgle at night, um, keep in mind 60% or so of the burglaries are daytime occurrences, not so much at night. But if they do occur at night, if somebody specializes in nighttime burglary, they're looking for houses that are brightly lit like that because somebody's got something in there that they value. So you're saying, hey, here it is. Come get it by putting a big sign up. And here's just an example, globe lighting on a street and kind of dark and dingy versus full cutoff lighting. And again, you've got light on the ground where you need it. And this is a study that was done in 2000. Um, Chicago had this wonderful experiment going. Back in the late 1980s, they put a lot of money into increasing the light output in their alleys. They went and chained 100 watt street lights to 250 watts. And they changed out about 60,000 lights. And then they ran out of money. So 60% of the town had all these new lights and 40% didn't. And this study actually took two areas that they called an experimental and a control. Same demographic makeup, uh, very similar population, same area. And then they looked at the before and after effects of the lighting on these areas. And this is just a real quick summary. Basically, before the lighting was changed, these are the crime figures. And after the lighting was changed, pretty much the brighter the light, the more crime. And most of it was, you can't really see here, what they called non-index crimes. And the majority of it was substance abuse or drugs. Um, some increase in the violent crimes, but everything was the absolute reverse of what they thought. They were seeing that lighting doesn't necessarily make you safer, but smart lighting does. There is a group, I have uh, some flyers from International Dark Sky Association there on safety and security. There is a uh, website that's a uh, Center for Environmental Crime Prevention, I forget the name of it, but it's a group that specializes in crime pre prevention through environmental lighting. And uh, they find that when you light bright, you, make, you do enhance safety, you do enhance, you know, we're not saying no light is going to make you more secure. We're just simply saying put the light where you need it and you can have that. And we have to keep in mind that a lot of power plants are coal fired and a lot of power plants are gas fired. So we are putting pollutants into the air. And this is simply some of the numbers uh, that one state came up with. So every kilowatt you get that amount of pollutants coming out. Uh, this is one of my favorite buildings in Delray. <laughs> <laughs> what is that building? The ABC part of the building, right? Wow. <coughs> and you can see they've got something like 12, <coughs> must be 1,000 watt metal halide bulbs all around that building. After 11, it's still on. It's mm -hmm. on all night. Really? I mean, do we need that? Probably not. Mm. And it's important to note that a half a ton of coal gives you 100 watts of uh, incandescent, 100 watts of any kind of bulb, uh, dust to dawn, and that's in a year. Mm. And when you burn coal, you put mercury into the environment. So a lot of people don't know that the Food and Drug Administration 
says that women and women of childbearing age and children should not eat poor fish at all, period. And that's sharks, tilefish, swordfish, and king mackerel because high mercury levels in the fish. And a lot of the mercury comes from, most of the mercury actually comes from coal-fired power plants. So basically from our electrical use. It's okay, just go grab a seat. Hi. I'm glad you came. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do the next. And obviously the more energy you burn, the more global warming is effective. So uh, I love this slide. <laughs> you can't do better than that. And this just shows that uh, Dr. Moda, um, who does work with the ANA board, uh, he encouraged the board to come up with this, um, where the AMA was encouraging energy efficient lighting, uh, not causing waste. Obviously, pollutants are going to affect your health, so there is an interest in that. Um, reduce glare because that makes you safer and to try to use a lighting design that is just not going to waste our energy. And light pollution, there's a lot of evidence now that light pollution does affect human health. Um, all these things interferes with circadian rhythm. Um, we're going to talk about melatonin suppression, sleep disturbances, and there actually was uh, all Things Considered today had a segment on sleep disturbances in Alzheimer patients and how they treated it with just simple lighting changes mm -hmm. and actually improved their Alzheimer's patients. They weren't as fidgety and agita agitated. They actually settled in and they slept at night, which was really strange for them. Um, I suspected when I was in the child with leukemia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a paper way back in 1987, and uh, it proposed that exposure to light at night suppress melatonin production, um, which may explain some of the high and uncount risk of breast cancer in industrialized countries. And here are the rates of breast cancer. And you can see lots of it going on up in North America, um, not so much in China and not so much in Africa. This would be Japan in the 1950s. That's Japan today. So they've seen a big increase in uh, breast cancer. When you look at the world, and just think about where all the breast cancer cases were, not so much Africa, not so much South America, Europe, lots of light, United States, lots of light. Japan, lots of light now. China, we expect to see a big increase in their cancer rates pretty soon because they have just in the last 20 years just increased their lighting tremendously. So it's really interesting that you can almost correlate the light levels with the breast cancer rates. And for those of you that are into chemistry, there's melatonin in all its glory. And it is something that helps us with our circadian rhythms. It is a hormone that our body uses. At night, if you're in doing a normal sleep wake cycle, um, you have melatonin production in your body at night and during the daytime, much less. Uh, this person at the National Institute of Mental Health um, wanted to look at the effect of dark on melatonin production. It's another one of the earlier papers. And here's the situation as we know it. Uh, in the old days, before we had electric lights, we had basically 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. For the last 130 years, we have electricity, we have shift work, people are up late, we have late night TV, all that. Uh, short sleep, all kinds of lights going on. In the past, we actually had a sleep cycle where you would go to sleep and you're sleeping for 12 hours. You're not sleeping for 8 hours. You know, assume we're in a normal time. And if you're by a campfire, 
you may wake up, see the campfire, and just think of that, think about your dreams, and then you go back to, into a deeper sleep. And now we're kind of stuck with this seven or eight hour sleep where not many of us remember our dreams anymore. I remember dreams when I was a child, not so much as I get on, got older. Plus, if you live in a city area like we do, excuse mm -hmm. me, this had this thought. <clears throat> Even if we might keep the lights low and turn them off in our own home, the lighting that you have on the streets in the area around you yeah. invades your house and they're all over, so it still has an impact. Light trespass. Yes. Uh, this is the results of this study. Um, that's just simply a percent that of sleep that you're in, 100% being totally asleep. And when you have that eight hour cycle, this is the kind of sleep you have, and there's your melatonin production. And when you're doing that 12 hour, here's that kind of wakefulness, dream catching stage, and then you go back to sleep. But when you look at the melatonin production, the area under that curve is a lot bigger than that one. You've got a lot more melatonin going into your body. Why is that important? Um, studies since then have shown that intense light at night suppresses your melatonin. So you could lose that melatonin you're normally producing at night. The most effective light to reduce that melatonin is the blues. And that's because the sunlight is what is supposed to set our circadian rhythm as well. It's not just dark, it's bright. And it need, you need to have that sunlight, that blue light, to help set your clock, as well as the darkness. So that's why they think the blue is most effective at disrupting your circadian rhythm. It's not something we normally would see before electricity. And um, <clears throat> the higher the intensity, the greater the reduction in melatonin. And it's believed from this study that women may be more sensitive to the suppressive effect. So women's eyes are a little more sensitive, um, and their melatonin goes down a lot quicker. You, you didn't mention the red light the being the least. Yeah, red light is one of the best. Um, we've all seen the submarine movies from World War II, where they're all down there in the submarine, and the lights are all red. And that's just so they preserve their night vision. And it's actually been found, um, one of the studies actually on that all things considered thing today um, was talking about putting yellow lights around the bathroom door in the assisted care facilities. And it reduces the number of trips and falls at night when people are up trying to find the bathroom because they can orient to it. The yellow doesn't turn them on, you know, wake them up and glare in their eyes. Uh, California was actually thinking of passing an ordinance to require amber or red lights in assisted care facilities at night so that the patients would be safer and have better sleep. So that's part of it. Studies have also shown that exposure to just simple room, room light before bedtime uh, suppresses melatonin onset, so I suppose I have to apologize for ruining our night with the bright <laughs> screen. And another study showed more recently that even uh, computer screens are a big issue because computers tend to put out a lot of blue light. And we all know the old blue screen of death if you use Windows. Um, there's a lot of blue light that comes out of these things. And most people are using these late at night just before you go to bed. Uh, this is part of a normal circadian rhythm. I just want to point out, here's your melatonin secretion starting kind of around 9, 10 at night. And there's your deepest sleep time, all the movement suppressed, all this stuff is going on because of your circadian rhythm. Um, and then your melatonin stops in the morning and you're on your way to a normal day. Lots of things go on because... That would be good to put on your wall just as a reminder what you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Five minutes. Probably. That's fine. Okay. When you disrupt the circadian rhythm, uh, this mm -hmm. is what they see happening. Um, cancer, breast, more data is, is on breast cancer. 
recently they're becoming more data on prostate cancer. Uh, hormone related cancers in general seem to be affected by lighting issues. Obesity, uh, leptin and um, ghrelin are both uh, little hormones that leptin um, kind of encourages you to start eating and ghrelin kind of makes you stop. So these are hormones that are also affected by the circadian rhythm disruption, so it may help lead to obesity. Um, they're still working on that. There's not a heck of a lot of data on it, but they definitely are seeing changes in these uh, hormones. Uh, there's some evidence that glucose metabolism is messed up, and certainly mood disorders. You've all heard of the seasonal affective syndrome, uh, or it's sad, yeah. seasonal affective disorder. Um, yeah, where you need that blue light if you live way up north and you don't get a lot of sunlight. Imagine most of us are indoors working all day, so a lot of us are lacking the sunlight that we really need to help set our clocks. So we need light sometimes and we don't need light other times. We do have a set of what we call clock controlled genes or genes that depend on this circadian rhythm. Um, as you see here, 5 to 10 percent of them are all part of it. Um, and again, these are genes that are crucial to cell function. The clock controlled genes are things that will help a cell mature and also help a cell in a pre-programmed death. So if you have a cell going into pre-programmed death as it should go, if something goes wrong with that process, you could have that cell turn into a cancer cell. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Animal evidence for all this uh, was by Blass um, initially in 2005. He actually took human breast cancer tumors and implanted them in the uh, rats, new rats. And then they would perfuse the tumors in the rats with blood from people that were exposed to light at night or not exposed to light at night. And what they found was light at night increased tumor growth dose dependently, which means that the more light you got, the more tumor growth you got. So that is the really strong evidence that uh, light and breast cancer can be very closely linked. Obviously, if you're exposed to light at night and you have less melatonin, you're going to have faster tumor growth. And they have found melatonin is the agent that seems to suppress tumor growth. <laughs> and on humans, um, I've been talking about that, uh, shift workers, uh, people that work all night, are, tend to be at higher risk. Studies show that blind women are at lower risk because they don't see the light at all either way. Uh, been talking about lit bedrooms that may increase risk and uh, apparently long sleep lowers risk. There are studies that actually separated people out. People that slept less than seven hours, people that slept seven to eight hours, and then people that slept longer, they found lower cancer risk in the people that would sleep longer. A lot of these studies were done uh, in flight attendants. Uh, this study actually was done from the 60s to the late 80s. Um, and the purpose of the study was to see the effect of cosmic radiation on the uh, flight attendants. And they ended up finding out that increased cancer rates were a real result. Uh, again, breast cancer in the blind reduced risk. Um, there's a, a correlation with late night reading in the bedroom and, and cancer, uh, and as I mentioned, the sleep duration. With L-A-N? Light at night. And those are some of the studies for the uh, low breast cancer risk in blind women, and it kind of flies in the wrong direction. Uh, because most doctors think blind women should have higher risk.